Là où je suis là. Oi, you got a ticket? I've got a ticket. Then you've had it, we're full up. Of course you're full up. I'm in the show. Staff and stage hands round the back. Staff and stage hands? I'm the star of the show. I'm Tommy Trinder. No, oh, no, no, no. That's Tommy Trinder. Here, what have I got to do to you to prove that I'm Tommy Trinder? Right, identification. Cop that. Ha <laughs> ha, you lucky people. If I go out, could you do it again? <laughs> that makes, makes me feel good. I got in, didn't I? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I must say, I've got no idea why they put me in this show. The old boy network? Me? How old am I? If it's who I think it was shouted, I'm old enough. <laughs> I'm younger than Bob Hope. I'm younger than Arthur Askey. I'm younger than Stanley Holloway. Everybody's younger than him. <laughs> Who? What do you mean, shut up? Her speech is my bread and butter. You keep talking, dear. Yeah, I wish you lived next door to me. I'd get a reduction in my rates. <laughs> I'll tap the small talk, that's all I've got. Trevor, play me some music, fast and loud. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Trevor played at Buckingham Palace. At the conclusion of his performance, the Queen said, I think you're marvellous. And Prince Albert liked him as well. <laughs> Well, I started on the stage in 1921. So that means on the 5th of June coming, I should have been on the stage 58 years. Can you imagine that? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> if only the wife had taken laundry, I could pack all this up. <laughs> but you know, I must tell you, I was born in Streatham. Now, my father, he was born in Oxford. He thought he'd be an adventurer, and he came to London. He was the first fugitive from an Oxford accent. <laughs> he met my mother, they got married, according to papers I got from Somerset House. <laughs> <laughs> no individual laughing, please. <laughs> the others have been invited, the same as you, I still have a bit of time in there. <laughs> my father was a baker. He came to London, he yearned for the open life. So he became a tram driver. <laughs> At first, my father didn't drive it, he used to just feed the horse. <laughs> well, Dad drove a tram at Streatham. I was born in Streatham. He was one of the first drivers that used to do this daily job. So we got transferred to Hammersmith, he did, and we lived in Fulham. See, thereby hangs a tale. If it hadn't been for Dad being transferred to Fulham, I might have been a rugby enthusiast today. <laughs> well, now, as a youngster, I used to go around. I didn't used to collect cigarette cards or play marbles. But, you know, one looks at things like opportunity locks and new faces. That has been going on for years and years. And they used to call it talent contests or go-as-you-please competitions. Well, a pal of mine, a schoolboy pal, and myself, we used to go off every week and enter these competitions. Well, I entered one at the Collins Music Hall. Now, if the photographer hadn't been so tall, you would have seen the entrance. <laughs> what modern science has come to. He lowered that. Now, that front entrance was a pub. 
but you went through a little passage and you came into the music hall. Anyway, they used to run Go As You Please competitions, so my pal and I, we'd turn up and we went to it. Now, of all things, there was a repertory company playing that week, and between Act 1 and 2, they had a Go As You Please contest. So you can imagine what the play was like. <laughs> well, of all things, I won it. Now, believe it or not, in those days, I had a real soprano voice. It's just wear and tear's done this. <laughs> yeah, I had a voice like Julie Andrews, only more feminine. <laughs> and I, I sang my song, and I won a fiver. But they used to give you the prize on the Friday, and on the Saturday, you had to go to receive it. So they got an act for nothing. So I turned up on the Saturday to do my act and get my prize. Now, across the road at the Islington Empire, there was a show running called Casey's Court. A very wonderful show. It was a juvenile show, and they found some wonderful people, including the great Charlie Chaplin. That's Casey's Court. It looks like Fulham. But uh, <laughs> now you can tell it's not because they haven't got a cup. <laughs> Well, anyway, on the Saturday, remember? I haven't forgotten. I was, see there, and overcame Will Murray and said to me, how would you like to go on the stage? I said, who, me? Now, I was 12. I said, oh, yes. He said, uh, you sure? I said, yes. He said, well, uh, how long can you go without food? <laughs> so... <laughs> He said, you can have seven and six a week and you keep. Well, he came home, saw my mother and father, and they were tickled to death to get me away for seven and six a week. And uh, I must tell you, my first appearance professionally on the stage, there was a scene of a row of houses. And there were three practical steps. There was me in rags, dirty face, an old man smoking a pipe, and this is the first song I ever sung professionally in my life. What is a mammy, Danny? Everyone's got one but me. Is she the lady that lives next door? Who cooks my dinner? and sweeps up the floor. I've got no mammy to put me to bed, no mammy to send me to play. But I promise I'll be such a very good boy if you'll bring me a mammy someday. Well, after a year, or I think it was two years with Casey's Court, I left and went with an act called Phil Rees Stable Lads. Now, J uh, Jimmy Wheeler, he left Casey's Court, he went with the eight Lancashire Lads, and they used to go with acts like Parks, Eaton Boys, and with Phil Rees Stable Lads, we used to wear jumpers and sweaters, we danced, we tumbled, we were acrobats, and one of the first engagements I had with Phil Rees was with the Folie Bergère in Paris. At 14. <laughs> Can you imagine? I had to leave. <laughs> yeah. Every time I looked at the models, I used to get angry. <laughs> well, I was breastfed. <laughs> you see, um... <laughs> you know, you know, well, we used to do all that eccentric dance, there was thousands of them, and we used to do a thing like, there was a song, When My Sugar Walks Down the Street. Anybody remember that? Yes. Oh, I've got the right type of audience here. Walk <laughs> down the street, all the little birdies go tweet, tweet, tweet. And in the evening when the sun goes down, it's never dark if she's around. She's so affectionate and I'll say this, 
the when she kisses me, I sure say. When my sugar walks down the street, the little birdies go tweet, tweet, tweet. Da 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 Trevor and the boys refused to play the dance in case they had to give me the kiss of life. <laughs> well, do you know, <laughs> I went from one show to another, well, briefly, I went from one disaster to another, and uh, I went in summer season concert party. Now, this used to be wonderful. It used to be out on the beach, everything passing, including the trams and the crowds. We used to go around with a hat. You could earn a few, Bob. Then they invented collecting boxes and you couldn't get your hand in. <laughs> but what used to happen, the used to come through the tabs and he'd say, I called to say good evening and how do you do? We hope before you go, your life I'll show. Enjoy the fair we give you, it's on the cart. So I'll cut the cackle and start tabs for company. How do you do, everyone? How do How do you do? We are glad to see you here, well, Barbara. Hope you're feeling in the bacon. How's your father? How do you do, everyone? How do you we are the show to stop you feeling blue. You must like the fare we offer. It's past my hand and swapper. So how do you do? How do you do? How do you do? do, do, do? Hi. That goes better today than when I did it. <laughs> I think I'll come back with that. Well, time went on, and I got into variety. Now, I thought my life was complete. I'd worked very hard. I'd got a Moss Empire tour, and I thought life was settled because I used to be second turn everywhere and got 12 pounds. Out of that, to pay your fare, your costume, your agent's commission, a lot. But it was wonderful, because our digs were 25 bob a week all in. Yes. And you can't even get that in a boarding house now in Caster. <laughs> well, do you know, I was going around, life complete, and I, I must tell you, I was always second term. Now, the thing was, with a variety bill, they opened up either with a juggler or an acrobat. Then came what we call a stand-up comic. Each stand up you had to do 12 minutes. The reason being, behind you was a street cloth. And it was really an advert cloth. It was a sort of stationary commercial. There was an airship with somebody's self-raising flower, <laughs> a bus with somebody's knife polishing powder advertised on the side, a boy on a tricycle. And the thing was that the advertising agent made it be shown for 12 minutes. So that mean that the, meant the comic had to walk about so he wasn't hiding any one advertisement. <laughs> and he was out in the street, so I used to wear a hat. Yeah, and this was the act. As I was coming to the theatre, a funny thing happened. <laughs> then you find you were standing in front of Maserati T. <laughs> so, you remember? Good, it's true. So I, I did 12 minutes on a front cloth and used to wear a hat. Well, I was a bit shrewd. I used to look to the future and I said, well, one of these days, I'm going to lose my hair. Well, it's cheaper to buy a hat than it is to buy a toupee. There's a few of them wearing them today. I know one comic wears a toupee, he sprinkles salt on it to make it look natural. But anyway... <laughs> I've always worn a hat and I let it go old because I didn't want anyone to say my success had gone to my head. <laughs> now it's useful because you can do this with it, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. 
If you ever walk along the front of Great Yarmouth, pull your hat down like that. <laughs> so anyway, I... <laughs> <laughs> this hat, I might tell you, I've had for 35 years and I didn't buy it in the first place. <laughs> Basil Radford gave it to me. Oh? Do you want it back? No, it's nice. I like it. Whilst I was at Hippodrome, Birmingham, uh, I walk in, you see, on the Monday, and I said, right, to Ernie Clapham, he was the stage manager, I said, Ernie, your second turn's here. He said, you're not second turn. I said, I'm not opening the second half. I was a rebel. Of course, the two worst spots on a variety bill was first turn or opening the second half. He said, no, you're last to closing. I said, last to closing? He said, yes. Well, this worried me. I'd never been on a stage with an audience all seated. <laughs> Everybody was walking in. I say, good evening, you're late, trouble with the bike, good evening, madam, don't buy a programme, my name is Trinder. Mind you, there's a lot of people got a living on that material since. <laughs> good evening. I'll tell you what's happened. <laughs> if you tell me, well, anyway. <laughs> nice time to go out and buy fish and chips. You'll never know why Trinder wears a hat, and everybody else will. <laughs> so, I went on that night, and there was the audience all seated, see, and I clicked. Well, I, mean, I did very well. Well, on the Tuesday, George Black came in to see how Raymond Navarro was, because he wanted to sort of tell him a few tips about the Palladium. He saw me, so on the Wednesday, Val Parnell, who was George Black's general manager, he got on the phone and said, Mr. Black wants you to come to London. I said, when? He said, tomorrow. I said, don't be silly, I'm coming back on Sunday, you know, I'll see you on Monday. No, 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 he wants to see you. So I get my agent and we go and see George Black, and George Black said, how much will you take for two years' work? I said, what? So I'm going 15 days, 30 days, of September, April, June, then I had to find out if it was leap year. Uh, and after a long discussion, I said, do you mean in a lump? Or so much a week. It was easy to work out, but a week. He said, no, no. Well, we finally, my agent asked for £30 a week. I was only getting 12 And George Black said 25 So they settled for the first year for £27.10. Second year, £35. I was made. This was sensational. So I go back to Birmingham, and my biggest thrill and my greatest achievement, I travelled to London and back third class, and I charged them first-class fare. <laughs> well, eventually, we miss a lot of years. No starvation years. I've always had a good living out of show business. I uh, finally get booked at the Palladium with Arthur Askey. Now, Arthur was a great success with Bandwagon, and Jack Hilton had put it on at, which was the Prince's Theatre, it's now the Shaftesbury Theatre, and George Black saw it, and he took the show over and brought it to the Palladium for the summer season whilst the crazy gang had a holiday. Had a holiday, they went racing. <laughs> so, we, there were three acts, uh, apart from Arthur and Stinker, uh, George Black put in, he put in um, Jack Durant, uh, Marion Ballet and English Brothers, Florence Oldham and myself. So we went through the show and Jack Durant was a big American who looked exactly like Clark Gable. And he used to walk on and say, well, Gable gets $200,000 for making love to Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar could have me for two shillings. <laughs> he said, can Clark Gable do this? And he used to jump and do a back somersault. Then he used to come in the middle of my act to say, Good <laughs> Trinder, can Trinder do this? Bang, bang, bang. And it was gone. So he was working at the Palladium and the Hoban Empire. So he came up to me and he said, uh, Tom, is there any guy at the Hoban this week I can walk on in the middle of his act? I said, Yeah. Billy Carroll. Now, Billy Carroll and Hilda Mundy, great pals of mine. And Bill 
before he was a great drunk comedian, was an acrobat and a dancer. I said, yeah, you go on him, Billy Carroll's act. So I phoned Bill and I said, you've got a guy called Jack Durant. He'll come on in the middle of your act. He's going to throw a somersault. So, okay. So when uh, Jack Durant came back and opened, I said, well, how'd you get on? How'd I get on? Son of a bitch. <laughs> I walked on through a back somersault and said, can he do that? And he did it and said, yeah, but I don't have to. <laughs> Next, during the war, long came ENSA, you know, E-N-S-A. Troops thought that stood for every night something atrocious. <laughs> or even Naffy stands aghast. <laughs> and I used to leave the Palladium and go out on a one-man tour. I used to do a one-man show. You wouldn't believe I could stand up and talk for 20 minutes on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and I finished up, you see, during the time uh, I was with Ensa. I played France, Italy, Egypt, Syria, Palestine, India, Ceylon, Malay States, Java, Sumatra, Burma, and Japan. I went to Japan for the Australian forces because there were not enough British troops to justify a show. But the lovely thing was that the government said anybody who spent 24 hours in the theatre of war was entitled to a campaign ribbon. And they said the artists were entitled to it. You should see me on Armistice Day. <laughs> I've got three rows of medals and I never carried a rifle. <laughs> a sheet of music. But mind you, I was in the home guard. I did clear all the Germans off Clapham Common. <laughs> well, I went through Italy, France, everywhere, and I went through with the Highland Division. And I'd like to show you a little clip of a film that was taken when I was entertaining the troops Outside the theatre in Foggia, it was too full up to go inside, so I entertained the crowd outside. A recent visitor to Italy, Tommy Trinder, arrives at the Garrison Theatre in Foggia, where men of the 8th Army were obviously delighted to meet him. But as to that, well, judge for yourself. Really, I should be here in battle dress. You know, when I left England to come and work for Ensign, I said, uh, you'll have to wear a battle dress. I said, well, what's the idea? I mean, after all, I, I'm an actor, not a soldier. So he said, well, you'll have to wear a battle dress because if you get captured by the Germans, they'll shoot you. I said, if the Germans capture me, they're entitled to shoot me. <laughs> Good afternoon, rich people. <laughs> First Americans I've seen not riding in a Jeep. <laughs> oh, they've all got their own personal Jeeps. <laughs> yes. Same as this one they've given me. Gave it to me instead of a gas mask. <laughs> took one look at my face and said, we're awfully sorry, but we've got no gas masks for horses. <laughs> so I said, well, what's the, what am I going to do? They said, have a jeep. If ever there comes a gas attack, you can drive away from it. <laughs> was a long time ago but I still meet so many people who remember it and people who remind me of various places I went to that normally I could never have gone to but you know that's one thing about show business the opportunity gave me of meeting people you know I was playing the Hippodrome Portsmouth and uh, I thought on Saturday I'd go and see Portsmouth play so I went along and Vernon Stokes who was then chairman of Portsmouth said uh, Tommy, would you look after our president? Well, I didn't think for the moment who their president was, and I said, sure, sure. So we'll sit with him and stand, entertain him. I found myself sitting next to Field Marshal Montgomery. He was president of Portsmouth. Well, I sat all through the first half while he was cracking his jokes. <laughs> and came half-time, and as you know, at a football match, 
they put up the half-time scores of clubs all around the matches all around the country. So I looked, and Fulham were winning 3-0. And I said to Montgomery, well, Fulham are winning 3-0. Of course, we're very lucky, you know. Our star player is only 19. That was Johnny Haynes. And Montgomery said, Al, what about his national service? <laughs> I said, he's a cripple. Well, I was on the board at Fulham for 36 years. I was chairman for 25 years. Now they've made me uh, the president. I'm the president of Fulham. Mind you, I'm very worried. I know what happened to two other presidents. <laughs> well, of course, from football, another great milestone in my life, films. I was a film actor. <laughs> <laughs> Who said, and then came talkies? <laughs> One of my favourites, Champagne Charlie, which was the life story of George Laban. All round town it is the same. By pop, 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 by rose to fame. I'm the idol of the barmaid, and Champagne Charlie is my name. A film. I, they, they put me in the fire service and I made a film called The Bells Go Down in which I was a cockney fireman in the middle of the blitz. Now we went to real fires and we had real fire fighting apparatus and I had to go on a turntable ladder. Hello, I'm going in. That's off duty. Can you smell cooking? <laughs> but you know. 
When that film was showing at the Empire Leicester Square, I was in a show at the Palladium. And one night at the Palladium, a man and woman walked in late, and I said, good evening, sir. You're very late, you know. This is not the cinema. One show, and you have to go. But if you're going to the cinema, you want to go to the Empire Leicester Square. There's a wonderful film showing there. He said, no thanks. I prefer to see you die here. <laughs> well, I suppose the first film that I made at Ealing was one of the most successful. It's one that I enjoyed more, I suppose, than any other. It was a film called Sailors 3. All over the place, wherever the sea may have to be, a sailor is found knocking around the South, east or the west, there's half of the world tattooed on his chest and all over the place, all around the universe in any port of war, getting his fun, the son of a gun, never staying very long in any place at all, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere, he's all over the place, the ladies adore to get him ashore, he's there for a day and then he's away, all over the coming here to the windmill at Great Yarmouth because it really has got memories for me. On this very stage was the first time that the great Sunday night at the Palladium feature, Beat the Clock, was performed. I started Sunday night at the Palladium. It used to finish like this, remember? <laughs> I had to leave, the wife didn't like the crowd I was going around with. <laughs> but, uh, well, one of the greatest ever, and naturally a household word, everybody who comes onto this programme, and I hope after this it will go on, <laughs> the great Eddie Gray. Eddie was my great pal for over 40 years. He never called me anything else but governor, I never called him anything else but genius. And we, I was doing a show, at, we were at Eastbourne, and Eddie comes up to me and said, Gov, I want you to do a gag with me. I said, what do you want? He said, I want you to run on, say, what do you have for breakfast this morning? I'll say, I had it. you say, Finnan? I'll say, no, a thicken. <laughs> I said, will you go away? Leave me alone. He said, Governor, it'll get a big laugh. I said, you jugglers who want to be comedians drive me mad. Go away, leave me alone. He said, please, will you? I said, all right. So he said, well, we'd better rehearse it. So he, he said, look, can you come down tomorrow night early before the show starts and rehearse it on the stage? I said, all right. So I ran on, did it. He said, no, no, it's better if you come on from the other side. So I came from the other side, he said, that's lovely. Well, just before he goes on, he said, Governor, you will do the game? I said, yes, of course I will. He said, well, let's have a little rehearsal. It's all right. What are you having for breakfast this morning? Had a fillin? No, thicken. He said, beautiful. Oh, the timing, marvellous. So the queue came, I ran on and said, what are you having for breakfast this morning? He said, cornflakes. I, uh, I had the honour of doing a command performance at the Palladium with monster Eddie Gray and on the bill was the late Maurice Chevalier. Well, Her Majesty the Queen Mother, who was then Queen, was being presented to the artist, or artist was being presented to her, and she got to marry <laughs> got to Maurice Chevalier and she spoke the most fluent French, which they had a long conversation in French, got to Eddie Gray and Eddie said, 
Vous can parler français tomorrow if vous wants to, you know. <laughs> and the Queen Mother said, I'm sorry, Mr. Gray, I don't speak your kind of French. <laughs> and then he said, that's a turn up for the book, isn't it? <laughs> well, I've had some wonderful associations with the royal family. I'm a great royalist, I love them. Duke of Edinburgh, I suppose I've seen a great deal of, and I remember on one occasion we made the Duke of Edinburgh a companion rat of the Grand Order of Water Rats, and I had the honour to be King Rat that year. Well, we had a luncheon in Grover Square, and I that day was off to sail to South Africa. Well, my wife and daughter, they were already on the boat. I'd arranged for a motorcycle, the car was no good, to pick me up, take me to Battersea to the heliport, get a helicopter, fly to Southampton, and land on the deck. So, <coughs> during my speech, I had to say, I hope you'll pardon me, Your Royal Highness, but I have to leave the function before its conclusion. I'm leaving today for South Africa. I have a helicopter all ready to take me to the boat. And the Duke of Edinburgh said, don't you mean the ship? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, sir, but my wife caught the boat train to get on it. <laughs> but I think the greatest story I can tell about the royal family, I, with Larry Adler and Max Wall, when the present Queen Mother was Duchess of York, she received the freedom of the city of Edinburgh. And I, with Larry and Max, were invited to go to Edinburgh and take part in the entertainment as part of the festivities. The following week, Edward abdicated and they became king and queen. Eight years later, whilst I was at the Palladium, in the middle of the war, I was invited to Windsor to do a show. The royal family, naturally, for security reasons, couldn't go to a theatre, so I went down, I did a show, and at the con conclusion I was presented to His Majesty, he put his arm around my shoulder, his face, his manner, everything was so familiar, you felt that this was somebody you'd known for years. And he said, you know, Tommy, it's wonderful to be able to laugh in days like this. I said, well, sir, the last time I had the honour to entertain you was eight years ago in Edinburgh. He said, yes, yeah. I remember it very well. He said, you've climbed very high since those days, haven't you? I said, well, you haven't done so bad yourself. <laughs> about you must have lousy homes <laughs> it's all over you know <coughs> I don't know anymore and if I do I wouldn't say it because I, I, my wages stop when that blind has gone up again <laughs> I've never had a theatre on my own before <laughs> and what's more all the doors are locked you try and get out <laughs> after this we play bingo <laughs> well they do everywhere. Do you know where I live? There's a Catholic church hall. Every Wednesday morning, bingo. The priest shouts the numbers. <laughs>